Welcome to the ACNC's webinar on what to do before you apply to register a charity. I'm Sam Laurie, I'm the Guidance and Education Manager at the ACNC and with me is Matt Crichton from our communications team. We'll be presenting today's session. Also assisting us today by answering your questions live during the webinar are Nicola Bennett, one of our Law Interpretation Specialists, Lee Law, one of the ACNC's Legal Counsel, and Matthew Peterson, Not-for-Profit Risk Manager from the Australian Taxation Office. Also helping us out is Minori, also from our communications team. This session aims to help you to know what issues you need to consider before applying to register an organisation as a charity and what information you need to have available when you do apply. We'll be having a look at issues such as legal structure and charitable purpose. There will be information for people who haven't yet set up their charity and for those who have an existing not-for-profit but are considering whether or not to apply for charity registration. Depending on your situation, the information you need will be different but we'll try to answer as many of your questions as we can. So, a few tips before we start. If you have any difficulties with the sound on your computer, try calling the phone number listed in the GoToWebinar control panel. If you'd like to ask a question, you can type it at any time in the GoToWebinar panel, which should appear on the right-hand side of your screen. Use the chat or question box to ask a question. We'll also allow some time for some questions at the end, after the formal presentation has finished, when we'll stay online to chat. We'll answer your questions directly and privately, but if we think the answers would be useful for everyone, we can also respond to everyone. This will show the question and our reply. So, let us know if you want your question to be private. All attendees will be able to see the question that we respond to and our answer. We suggest you keep your questions general rather than very specific and in a way that identifies your charity. If there are any questions we can't answer during the webinar today, which may happen if we get a lot of questions or very complex questions, we'll provide answers at a later stage by email. We'll also provide contact phone numbers for specific queries later in the webinar. A recording of this webinar and the transcript and slides will be available on our website within a few days of the webinar. And finally, we value any suggestions you have to improve our webinars in the future. So please pass on your suggestions in the survey that will pop up at the end of this session. So, here's a summary of what we'll look at today. A bit about us at the ACNC and what we do and don't do. An overview of what a charity is, compared with a not-for-profit. Thinking about whether to register or not. And then, what you need to do before you apply. We'll start with a quick overview of the ACNC, our role, and what we do and don't do. Let's look first at what the ACNC does. The ACNC is Australia's national independent regulator of charities. We register charities who can then say that they have met our requirements for registration and they've agreed to be accountable and meet our governance standards. With registration, they're also able to apply for charity tax concessions and other benefits. We maintain an online database of every registered charity in Australia. We regulate charities by reviewing their compliance with ACNC obligations, including meeting the governance standards, and we look into concerns about charities raised by the public and other government agencies. We provide advice, guidance and education to charities on their obligations to the ACNC and on good governance. And finally, we have a responsibility in all of our work to try to reduce red tape for charities. So, we've covered what the ACNC does, but what doesn't the ACNC do? We do not resolve internal disputes within charities. The ACNC only deals with complaints and issues that relate to the legal requirements for charities under the ACNC laws. Other organisations that may be able to assist with internal disputes include dispute resolution services and centres in your state, such as the Dispute Settlement Centre of Victoria. The ACNC is additional to and not a substitute for any incorporating regulator 
such as a state consumer affairs agency if your charity is an incorporated association. We do have some arrangements in place to accept some reporting to state or territory regulators. We are not an advocacy body for the sector. The ACNC is a government body. It does not advocate for charities. Sector peak bodies such as ACOS, the State and Territory Councils of Social Services, and your service peak bodies, for example, for education groups, do this on your behalf. We are not trying to run your organisation or tell you how to run your organisation. We don't have the power to manage your organisation, only to require that you meet our requirements under the law. Beyond this, how you run your charity is up to you. The ACNC is not a legal advisor and does not provide legal advice. We can give you information on what you need to do to register and remain registered as a charity, but we cannot give you legal advice on your organisation's particular situation. We may be able to refer you to those who can. And finally, the ACNC is separate to the ATO and other government agencies. The ACNC is necessarily independent of other government agencies and is tailored to the charity sector. The ATO, the Australian Taxation Office, not the ACNC, decides tax issues like whether your organisation will be endorsed as a deductible gift recipient or DGR. However, the ATO accepts the ACNC's determinations of which organisations are charities and what types of charities they are. Matthew Peterson from the ATO's non-profit team will be able to answer ATO related questions during our webinar and afterwards via our online Q&A system. Despite being called the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission, at the moment we only regulate registered charities. As you can see in this slide, there is a large number of not-for-profits in Australia with only a proportion of those being registered charities and then another small proportion being deductible gift recipients or as Sam said, otherwise known as DGRs. So what is a not-for-profit? Generally, a not-for-profit is an organisation that does not operate for the profit, personal gain or other benefit of particular people. It can make a profit but that profit must be used to achieve its purpose. Not all not-for-profits are charities. Charities are a subset of not-for-profits. In addition to being not-for-profit, charities have charitable purposes for the public benefit. You'll need to show the ACNC that your organisation meets the legal definition of charity when you apply to register. So what is a deductible gift recipient? or a DGR. DGR endorsement is granted by the ATO. Donors to DGRs can deduct the amount of their donation from their own taxable income when they lodge their tax return. Only a small proportion of charities and other not-for-profits are eligible to have deductible gift recipient endorsement. Now we'll look at some of the things to consider when you're deciding whether to apply to register your organisation as a charity. There are a few essential things to consider before you decide whether you want to apply to register a charity. Do some background research and ask some questions. Are you starting? A new charity? If you are considering starting a new charity, you should ask whether setting up a new charity is the best way to achieve your goals or whether there's another not-for-profit you could support or pull resources with. Many people decide they want to raise funds for research into specific diseases after the illness of a loved one or to raise funds for a disadvantaged or disaster affected community they have visited. Setting up a charity is not the only option. Find a charity or not-for-profit you could set up uh, a trust 
which could be earmarked to go towards a specific or existing charity or not-for-profit. You can search the ACNC register for free to find charities that may already be doing the type of work you want to do. Just go to acnc.gov.au forward slash find a charity. You can also look at the ATO's content for not-for-profits at ato.gov.au and their section on getting started. If you have an existing not-for-profit, consider whether it might be eligible to register as a charity and whether this is worth doing. Many worthwhile organisations operate on a not-for-profit basis, such as local sporting clubs or Lions clubs, but may either not be eligible to be registered or registration may not provide sufficient benefit for them. We'll talk more about eligibility later. You may not need to be registered to receive tax concessions. Some not-for-profits can self-assess and get tax concessions or benefits without being registered as a charity with the ACNC and still achieve their goals. When you're thinking about these things, you can also use our checklist to help you decide. Go to acnc.gov.au forward slash start charity. Just remember, starting a charity does involve obligations such as keeping records, reporting to us and notifying us of changes in your charity. The people on your governing committee also have responsibilities, so it can take time to run a charity. So think about whether that's something that you want to do. If you do want to register your not-for-profit as a charity, you might ask um, what the benefits are and what registration will require. One of the main benefits is that your organisation will be eligible to apply to the ATO for charity tax concessions, such as income tax exemption or GST concessions. Depending on your organisation's charitable purpose, it may also be able to apply for additional tax benefits as a public benevolent institution, otherwise known as a PBI, a health promotion charity, which is also known as an HPC, or as a charity advancing religion. It may be able to apply for endorsement for certain categories of deductible gift recipient, the DGR that we mentioned earlier, and may receive a range of other Commonwealth concessions, benefits or exemptions available to charities. And finally, with registration, you'll have a free online presence on the ACNC Charity Register. This is where the public can find out about your charity and see that it is under ACNC regulation. As I said earlier, each registered charity has ongoing obligations to the ACNC and must meet these to remain registered. Firstly, charities must be not-for-profit and pursue their charitable purpose, and they must remain that way. Secondly, your charity must notify the ACNC of certain changes and report annually to us. You must notify us if your charity changes its legal name, if your charity changes its address for service, that is, where legal documents can be sent, if your charity changes its responsible persons, these are the directors, committee members or trustees, or if your charity changes its governing documents, such as its constitution, rules or trust deed. In addition to this, all charities except corporations registered with the Officer of the Registrar of Indigenous Corporations must report to us by submitting an annual information statement and, for medium and large sized charities, a financial report every year. This statement is due within six months of the end of your reporting period and can be submitted through the ACNC Charity Portal. Thirdly, your charity must keep financial and operational records. And fourthly, you must meet the ACNC's governance standards. All charities, except a very specific group of what we call basic religious charities, must comply with the ACNC's governance standards. These five standards set out a minimum standard of governance to help promote public trust and confidence in charities. And we'll go over this a bit more later. Finally, as well as meeting the ACNC's requirements, you must continue to meet any other obligations your charity has under other laws and to other government agencies. For example, if your charity is an incorporated association, you'll still have to report to your incorporated association's regulator. 
We're going to look next at what you need to have sorted out before you apply. You need to know the following things about your organisation. Number one, is it eligible to be a charity? Is it not-for-profit and does it have a charitable purpose for the public benefit? Number two, what is its legal structure? Number three, does it have an ABN? Number four, do you have a publishable name for your charity and details of its board or its committee members? And number five, what tax concessions do you want and do you know what you're eligible for? First of all, your organisation, for your organisation to be registered as a charity, it must operate on a not-for-profit basis, both while it's operating and also when it winds up or closes down. This means that it can't operate for the profit, personal gain or other benefit of particular people, such as, such as the members, the people who run it or their friends and relatives. An organisation can still be not-for-profit if it provides a benefit to a member while it's genuinely carrying out its purpose. A not-for-profit can pay a staff member and sometimes a board or committee member for their work, but not an unreasonable amount. The payment must not exceed commercial terms and it should be consistent with the level of work done. A not-for-profit can actually make a profit and have a surplus, but these must be used for, they, they must be used for or intended to be used for the organisation's charitable purpose. A not-for-profit can keep its profits as long as the reason is in line with its purpose. For example, it may be saving up for a new project or it may be accumulating a reserve so it continues to be sustainable. Not-for-profits should not hold on to significant profits indefinitely, as this may suggest that it's not working solely towards its charitable purpose. You can demonstrate that your organisation is not-for-profit by including clauses in your governing documents that state this. The two clauses on the slide are examples of how you can do this, and this information is also available at acnc.gov.au forward slash not-for-profit. The not-for-profit clause sets out how the organisation's assets and income are used and distributed while it's operating. The dissolution clause sets out what happens to the organisation's assets if it dissolves or if it winds up. Some organisations can also show their not-for-profit character through the operation of certain laws such as state or territory incorporated associations legislation or trust law, for example, with charitable trusts. So we've looked at not-for-profit and now we're going to talk about something really important. Uh, there's quite a lot of detail here, but um, charitable purpose is one of the key things that you need to look at when you're applying to register. So after demonstrating that your organisation is not-for-profit, you need to show that it has a charitable purpose. This is one of the most important elements, as I said. If your organisation is registered as a charity, this purpose usually becomes its charity subtype. So, what's a charitable purpose? A charitable purpose is the reason a charity has been set up and what its activities work towards achieving. It might also be called its object or mission. Charitable purpose has a special legal meaning developed over years by courts and parliament. The courts have recognised many different charitable purposes and as society changes, new charitable purposes are accepted. Since the 1st of January 2014, the Charities Act 2013 has defined what a charity is for ACNC purposes. It lists 12 charitable purposes which include advancing religion, advancing education, advancing health and advancing the natural environment. Some types of purposes that would be considered charitable include helping people who are experiencing some type of disadvantage, for example due to ill health, poverty or age, raising awareness of health issues, advancing culture such as preserving Australian Indigenous heritage through a museum or promoting the arts, protecting the safety of the public 
such as through a surf life-saving service. Some purposes may be beneficial for the community but are not charitable at law. For example, sport-related purposes are generally not charitable but they may, may become charitable if they have a specific charitable focus. For example, if they are part of a curriculum for a school or are to assist people suffering from a particular disadvantage. Social or recreational purposes are generally not charitable. There are some purposes that are specifically not able to be charitable. These include providing private benefits to people such as members of an association of profession or industry, engaging or in or promoting activities that are unlawful or contrary to public policy, or promoting or opposing a political party or a candidate. These purposes are not able to be charitable. To be registered with the ACNC, your organisation must also only have charitable purposes or purposes which are ancillary or incidental to a charitable purpose. These kinds of purposes are those that further Instead, the film night was held to raise funds for the organisation's charitable purpose, then this might be seen as incidental to the charitable purpose. So, a charitable purpose also has to be for the benefit of the public. What does for the benefit of the public actually mean? There are many ways it can benefit the public. It can provide goods, services, education, counselling or spiritual guidance or improve the environment. Some types of purposes, for example advancing education, relieving poverty or advancing religion, are also presumed to be for the public benefit unless there's evidence otherwise. Charities may benefit the public generally or a particular group of people, for example a local community, refugees or young people. Charities do not have to benefit everyone in a community but if they restrict what they do, this must be consistent with their charitable purpose. For example, a food bank could restrict its beneficiaries to people who cannot afford their own food, but it could not restrict it to people based on their appearance. Another example is a healthcare support service that limits its activities to a particular geographic location. Your organisation may not be a charity if it is too restrictive in who can receive benefits. For example, an organisation set up to provide scholarships to employees of a particular employer is unlikely to be a charity. So, if you're starting a new charity and deciding its purpose, you might want to ask yourself the following questions. Does the purpose we're considering and that we are choosing that fits under the Charities Act really say what the organisation wants to achieve? Will this charitable purpose continue to be suitable over time? And will the activities of your organisation work towards this charitable purpose? This is really important. Only choose charitable purposes that really match what your charity wants to achieve. Read more at acnc.gov.au forward slash charitable purpose. As well as the 12 charitable purposes or subtypes in the Charities Act, there are two additional subtypes that your charity may be registered with. If your charity qualifies for one of these subtypes, it may be eligible for endorsement by the ATO as a DGR, as we mentioned earlier, the deductible gift recipient. The first of these additional subtypes is something I briefly mentioned earlier, it's called a Public Benevolent Institution or for short a PBI. The second one is called a Health Promotion Charity or its initials again for short HPC. As we mentioned earlier as well, only a small proportion, a proportion of registered charities are deductible gift recipients, DGRs. As there are very specific requirements for these DGR subtypes. 
few charities will be eligible. First, look carefully at your charitable purposes. And if you need help deciding which DGR category may be appropriate, then please contact the ATO or visit its website for more information. So, before you apply to register, you need to know what your organisation's legal structure is. If you're starting a charity from scratch, the legal structure you choose is one of the most important decisions you make because with the right legal structure, your organisation will be able to carry out its activities effectively and in compliance with the law, it will be able to evolve as it grows or changes, and it will be in a better position to deal with legal issues if they do occur. Some types of charities, such as certain ancillary funds, must be set up using a particular legal structure. The ATO has particular requirements for this. If you are choosing or reviewing the legal structure of your organisation, there are a number of factors to consider when making this decision, such as the size of your charity and complexity of its activities, whether your charity will want to operate in more than one state or territory or even overseas, whether your charity will have employees or volunteers, the type of accountability your charity will have to its members, if it has any, and the public the potential personal liability of members or office holders for things done by them on behalf of the charity. Whether your charity will be applying for government grants and the value and nature of assets held by the charity. There are many types of legal structure. Some examples of common legal structures for charities are incorporated associations, companies limited by guarantee, Indigenous corporations, cooperatives, private and public ancillary funds, trusts and unincorporated associations. You should know that you cannot register as a charity if you are an individual or if your organisation is a political party or a government entity. The ACNC cannot give you advice on which legal structure you should choose we can just provide some information on the, legal, on the different options. You may want to get legal advice on your situation as your organisation's legal structure has very important consequences for how your charity operates now and in the future. There is more information on our website and available from the ATO and other not-for-profit regulators as set out in the slide on your screen. Before you can apply to register, you will need an ABN for your organisation. If you're setting up a new charity or don't have an ABN for your not-for-profit, you can apply for an ABN on the Australian Business Register website. It can take some time to get your ABN. When applying for an ABN, you need to note three things. Number one. Make sure the name under which you're applying for the ABN is exactly the same as what you have chosen as the charity's legal name and is in your governing documents. Number two, check that the ABN entity type is the right one for the legal structure that you've created. If it isn't, you may need to reapply for a new ABN and this could delay your charity application. And number three, Apply for your ABN as soon as possible. We cannot register your charity before the date the ABN commences. If you have inquiries about the progress of your ABN application, we suggest you contact the Australian Business Register between 8am and 6pm, that's Eastern um, Standard Time, between, um, and weekdays, Monday to Friday, on 139226. Once you know or have decided on your charity's legal structure, you will need to create or have access to your governing documents. These may be, for example, your organisation's rules, its constitution, articles of association or a trust deed. The governing document is a very important part of the registration application and you will be asked to provide a copy. It must set out, as a bare minimum, 
the purpose of the charity and that the charity will operate on a not-for-profit basis both during its lifetime and also if and when the charity winds up. It may also set out important aspects of the organisation's operation, such as its membership rules, how it will make decisions, how meetings will be held, and how people are appointed to the organisation's governing body, such as the committee of management or the board, and the types of powers that the people on um, these bodies have. If you believe your organisation may be eligible for DGR endorsement, you will need to include certain clauses within your governing documents. You can find out more about this on our website at acnc.gov.au forward slash not for profit and you can also find out more information and, and examples on the ATO website. On our website there is information about template governing documents for different types of legal structures. If you are starting a new charity or want to upgrade your not-for-profits governing document, you can use a template. The template you select will depend upon the type of structure your organisation has or will have. For example, for people wishing to register a company limited by guarantee, we have a template constitution available on our website. The screen is showing a snapshot of the relevant page on our website where you can access some templates. Similarly, all of the state regulators of incorporated associations and ORIC have a standard set of rules, often called model rules, for those types of not-for-profits. When using the templates, you'll need to choose one that's suitable for the legal structure you wish to use for your charity, adapt the template to suit your charity's needs, and make sure you meet the requirements of both the ACNC and any other regulator if you choose if you choose to incorporate. If you want to create, create your own governing document, it must contain all the clauses necessary for us to register your, your organisation as a charity and also be suitable to support the governance of your organisation in the future. If you're unsure about how to get a suitable governing document, you may want to get professional advice or contact us on our advice line. Another important thing to consider is your charity's name and using it as part of your registration. If you already have a not-for-profit set up, its legal name is generally the name that you have registered with any other regulator such as ASIC, um, Fair Trading, Consumer Affairs or ORIC. It should be the name that is on the front of your governing documents. If you're starting a new charity, while you can generally choose your organisation's name, there are some important things you need to know when, when you're doing so. First, some regulators require the name to include the type of legal structure the organisation takes. For example, you may often see company names ending in limited or incorporated association names ending in incorporated. Also, many regulators, including the ACNC, are unlikely to accept or publish the names of organisations with the same or very similar name to that of an, another already registered organisation. This is because of the potential confusion that this can cause. When choosing a new name, you should consider a few things. Consider choosing something distinctive so that someone can find your charity when searching the register. Don't call it the Museum Trust, for example, which might return hundreds of charities with these common words in the name on the register. Avoid using words or acronyms that could cause offence in English or another language. Check that you have permission to use the name, for example, if it's somebody's name or subject to intellectual property rights, such as a trademark. And it's important to avoid using misleading names. For example, a name that suggests the charity does something or works in a particular location when, in fact, it doesn't really. So that's the name. 
Now we'll look at who governs the charity. To register a charity, you need to tell us the details of what the ACNC calls your responsible persons. This includes their names, dates of birth and addresses. It's important to note we don't publish their dates of birth and addresses on our public register. The responsible persons are those people who have ultimate responsibility for controlling the direction and governance of the charity. So it's important to have chosen appropriate people for this role and that they understand what the role involves. In rare situations, where necessary, they may be suspended or removed from their roles by the ACNC. Those responsibilities include directing the affairs of the charity, ensuring that it's able to meet its liabilities and is well run, and ensuring that the charity pursues its charitable purpose for the benefit of the members of the public it was set up for. The charity itself has obligations under the ACNC governance standards to make sure these people are suitable and to understand these duties. So, how do you work out who your organisation's responsible persons are? This can be clearer for some charities than others. Some common examples are in this table. For example, for incorporated associations, the responsible persons are the members of the Committee of Management. For a company limited by guarantee, an Indigenous corporation or a cooperative, these people are called the directors. For a trust, it's a trustee or the directors of a corporate trustee. For an, for an unincorporated association, it's not always clear. For example, for a religious organisation, there may be a central governing body with branches. We mentioned that a charity must ensure that it complies with the ACNC governance standards and that responsible persons must be suitable and understand their duties under these standards. These standards are very important. The governance standards are a set of core minimum standards that deal with how charities are run, including their processes, their activities and, and any relationships they have. Charities must meet these governance standards to be registered and remain registered with the ACNC. I will note that the government, governance standards do not apply to a limited class of charities called basic religious charities. Charities do not need to submit anything to the ACNC to show that they meet the standards, but charities must have evidence of meeting the standards that they can provide if they are requested to do so. The standards require charities to remain charitable, to be accountable to members, to follow Australian laws and ensure that the board members or directors are not only suitable but also understand and comply with the particular duties that apply to them as the members of a charity board or a committee. These standards are listed in the slide that you can see on the screen but there is plenty more detail on our website at acnc.gov.au forward slash governance standards. There is one topic that we haven't discussed yet, withholding information from the public ACNC register. You need to know that if your charity is registered, that some of the information you supplied as part of the registration application will appear on the ACNC register. This includes information such as the name of the charity, its ABN, governing documents and the names of responsible persons. Check you know which information will be published and which won't before you apply to have information withheld. You can apply to have some information withheld but there are only particular situations when we'll grant your request. For example, the information could endanger public safety. The slide lists the other reasons. It's not enough for the information just to be private or sensitive. And even if a charity meets one or more of the five situations set out in the ACNC Act, the ACNC may refuse to withhold or remove information where it considers that the public interest in displaying the information outweighs the likely adverse effect that publication may cause. Just a note, 
One of our most common requests is to withhold dates of birth and or addresses of responsible persons. The ACNC never publishes the contact details or dates of birth of any responsible person of a charity on the ACNC register, so you do not need to make this request. One final thing you need to consider before starting your registration application is what charity and other tax concessions may be available for your charity. Your charity must be registered with the ACNC before it can receive charity tax concessions from the Australian Taxation Office, the ATO. The main types of charity tax concessions are income tax exemptions, refunds on franking credits on dividends, goods and services tax, GST, concession and fringe benefits tax rebates. As we said earlier, some charities may also be eligible to apply for endorsement as a DGR. Just as a reminder, donors to DGRs can deduct the amount of their donation from their taxable income when they lodge their tax return. So, how do you apply for charity tax benefits? You can do this using the same registration form. After the ACNC has decided your charity status, we'll pass on your application for tax benefits to the ATO. The ATO accepts our decision on charity status and then decides which tax concessions your charity is entitled to, depending on your registered charity subtype. The ATO may also have additional requirements or special conditions that you must meet before you receive particular tax concessions. The ATO provides guidance on at www.ato.gov.au under Getting Started and what you need to start a not-for-profit and the types of concessions available. Endorsement by the ATO is the approval process charities must follow if they want to access tax concessions. There are two types of endorsement tax, as a tax concession charity what's called a TCC, or income tax exemption, GST, for income tax exemption, GST concessions and FBT concessions. The other type of endorsement is deductible gift recipient endorsement. Just a note about the process, ATO case officers will only, will contact you, they'll only ask you for information that has hasn't already been provided and they generally determine entitlements to charity tax concessions within 14 days of receiving all the required information. So, can your charity be endorsed as a tax concession charity? To be endorsed to access all charity tax concessions, your charity must have an Australian business number, an ABN, which the ACNC also requires, and be a registered charity. For income tax exemption, it must meet at least one of three tests. The In Australia test, the deductible gift recipient test, or the prescribed by law test, which I'll cover in the next slide. So, for the In Australia test, your registered charity will meet this test if it meets both of the following requirements. It has a physical presence in Australia, and to the extent that it has a physical presence in Australia, it incurs its expenditure and pursues its objectives principally in Australia. The deductible gift recipient test. Your registered charity will meet this test if it either has been endorsed as a DGR in its own right and not merely for a fund, authority or institution it operates, or it's listed by name in the tax law as a deductible gift recipient. The prescribed by law test. Your registered charity will meet this test if it is prescribed by name in the income tax regulations and one of the following applies. It is located outside Australia and is exempt from income tax in its country of residence or it has a physical presence in Australia but incurs its expenditure and pursues its objectives principally outside Australia. Now for GST and FBT concessions. For GST charity concessions, there are no additional tests required to access this concession. For FBT concessions, 
FBT rebates only available to registered charities endorsed to access income tax exemption with the exception of registered charities that are not institutions, registered charities that are institutions of the Australian Government, a state or a territory, and registered public benevolent institutions and registered health promotion charities. These organisations may be eligible for the FBT exemption. FBT concessions. FBT exemption. The FBT exemption is only available to endorsed and registered public benevolent institutions or health promotion charities. Public and not-for-profit hospitals and public ambulance services are eligible for FBT exemption and do not need to be endorsed to access the FBT exemption. And of course for any more information on these concessions, it's always good to check out the ATO's website or give their not-for-profit team a call. We'll provide the details for that a little bit later. There are also tax and duties concessions available to charities from state, territory or, or local governments. Your organisation does not need to be registered with the ACNC to receive state, territory or local government tax concessions. Um, the concessions that may be available at the state level or, or local level include um, stamp duty, um, a tax on some financial and property transactions, payroll tax, which is a tax on wages that exceed a certain threshold paid by employers, and land tax, a tax on landowners. Each state and territory has different requirements for accessing these sorts of concessions. Local governments may also give concessions to charities, for example on rates. For more about how to access the concessions available to charities um, at these levels, you should contact your local government or the relevant state or territory revenue office. We have a handy list of um, relevant offices or agencies at both levels on our website at acnc.gov.au forward slash regulator list. Okay, so you've decided your organisation may be eligible to register as a charity, you have an ABN and you've weighed up the benefits and obligations. Now, how do you go about applying to register your organisation as a charity? Use our online application form and you can find this on the website at acnc.gov.au forward slash register. It's important to note there's no fee for applying for registration if you're successful. As you work through the application form, you can refer to the registration guide, which is also available online. The form itself is not difficult to use if you have all the information you need ready. That's why before starting the registration form, it's probably a good idea to have a look at the guide just to get an idea of the type of information that you will need to provide to complete the form correctly. Also another thing that's important to note is that the ACNC will work with you to see if your organisation can, where possible, be registered. So please feel free to ask questions and seek clarification if you have any concerns during the application process. You can call us or email our advice services team for more help. So what happens after you've made an application? Well, each application will be assigned to a specific registration analyst to consider in detail. They'll contact you to introduce themselves and they'll also contact you if they need for more information. Either of these occasions are the ideal times to ask for further information or clarify any concerns that you may have. Feel free to ask questions and seek clarification if you have any concerns during the process. If you've forgotten something, like a winding up clause in your charity's governing documents, your analyst will give you the opportunity to correct the omission before finalising your application. We generally process applications within 28 days of receiving all of the required information. So the more you provide, the easier the process. 
will write to tell you if your application has been successful and send you a charity pack. In the charity pack you will receive a registration letter signed by the Commissioner, a registration certificate, a password to log into the ACNC charity portal and information about being a registered charity, including ongoing obligations to us. If your application is not successful, we'll write to tell you why and you can ask for our decision to be reviewed. Of course, we do get some applications from organisations that we can't register. And we do see a few common issues in applications. For example, one of the common ones is a lack of, lack of a suitable set of rules. This means that we can't identify the organisation's objects or whether it's not for profit. Sometimes these organisations just need a little bit more time and assistance to get their documents in order. We often find that such organisations reapply at a later date once they've done so. This is fine. There are no black marks given if you're not successful the first time around. Also another common issue we find is that organisation um, may not have a charitable purpose or has both charitable and non-charitable purposes. We've already spoken today about what being charitable means for the ACNC purposes. We sometimes get sporting or social clubs applying and unfortunately while these clubs may have very worthwhile purposes, they are not charitable. And some applications um, show private benefit to members. Some organisations may have a charitable purpose but they also provide private benefit to their members. For example, an organisation that is set up to promote the arts, which is charitable, but does this by promoting works for sale of particular artists who are members of the organisation, would not be eligible to be a charity. The slide on your screen sets out some of the common issues the ATO sees, such as missing or conflicting information, missing clauses, or a mismatch between DGR item numbers and the charity purposes. So there's an overview of the key things to keep in mind, whether you're starting a new charity or considering registering your existing not-for-profit as a charity. We hope that has been useful for everyone who joined us today. For more information, please visit acnc.gov.au. We have plenty of information on starting a charity, registering a charity and charity tax concessions. There's a list of links on the, on the slide. We also recommend that you visit ato.gov.au forward slash non hyphen profit for more information on taxation concessions and ATO endorsement. We also recommend the getting started content at not for profit laws information hub. And of course you can stay in touch with us at the ACNC in a number of ways, particularly by subscribing to our updates via the homepage. You can find out more information about the ACNC's webinars program at acnc.gov.au forward slash webinars. You can also view past webinars too at that page. There's the, the whole list of the program there and, and the past webinars are able to be streamed um, through the website. You can also call us on 13ACNC, which is 132262. Our phone lines are open between 9am and 6pm Australian Eastern Time and the summertime during the summer months and they are staffed by helpful people who understand the charity sector and can provide advice um, on how charities can meet their obligations to the ACNC. Our staff are trained to give general advice on a range of topics related to the regulation of charities. Um, you can also email them at advice at acnc.gov.au. This is a particularly good idea if your issue is complex or if you think it will need a detailed consideration. And of course we are active on social media, so you can find us on Facebook, Twitter and YouTube. And you can get some more information about the tax concessions available to charities from the ATO um, 
there's information on starting a not-for-profit and the range of benefits available. Visit ato.gov.au forward slash non-profit, that's non-profit. And you can call their not-for-profit team on 1300 130 248 between 8am and 6pm Australian Eastern Time on weekdays. So we'll finish the formal part of the presentation there. Thanks for joining us today and for your questions. We will remain online to answer questions for another 10 minutes or so and can share answers to questions that may have broad interest. If you have questions that are specific to your particular charity or a particular complex, we recommend you contact our advice services team or, if it relates to DGR endorsement or other tax issues, the ATO's non-profit team. Remember that the ACNC runs webinars for charities at least monthly on a broad range of topics. Our next webinar is on Tuesday the 8th of March and is aimed at new charity board members. It's called Welcome to the Board. Sign up for this or any other webinars at acnc.gov.au forward slash webinars. If you are interested in being kept up to date on webinars coming, please let us know in the survey at the end of this webinar. We also really appreciate feedback that you can give us so that we can improve our webinars in the future. You can also get in touch with our education team directly at education at acnc.gov.au. If there are lots of queries coming through and some are specific or we just aren't able to get to them today, we can email you back and you'll also all receive a follow-up email with some of the common questions and answers as well as a list of links that we've talked about in our presentation today. So thanks Matt for speaking with me today and also to Matthew Peterson from the ATO as well as our own Lee and Nicola for answering questions and Minori for her help. And thanks everyone for attending and making time in your busy schedules for us. Goodbye and see you next time. <laughs>